So uh, with open source software, uh, a lot of people can learn from it. They can inspect it. They can improve upon it. So over the last few years, there's a, a new emerging trend in hardware. And uh, Lamora is one of the pioneers in open source hardware. Uh, but it's a little unclear what it is. We're like, what do you mean open source hardware? What can you do with physical objects? And uh, we have, uh, we'll talk briefly what open source hardware means. And then we have some real examples. Um, examples like a cell phone, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth jammer. And there's lots of reasons why it has to be open source. Um, a, a, a little counter uh, kit uh, fashioned after the website Dig. So when you press it, it actually digs things like physically. Fun stuff. A uh, Minty Boost, which is a charger. The Chumpy, which is a uh, open source Wi-Fi uh, microcomputer. A uh, open source MP3 player. This is a Borduino. It's an Arduino, an electronic uh, learning platform that you plug into a breadboard. And um, a couple other things. So, um, more, when you have to tell people what open source hardware is, how do you divide it up? Is it like software? Like some things are open source, some things are. What are the, the different pieces of open source software hardware? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Phil. Um, <laughs> software is, is pretty easy to understand why open source works because it's basically just code. You know, you have your code, you compile your code, you get your binary. So, as long as you uh, distribute the source code, you're pretty much good to go. The problem with hardware is there's many, many layers of what is hardware. Uh, for example, there is you know, the plastic and the leather that goes into making the chumpy. There is um, you know, the circuit boards that go into making um, the cell phone jammer. There's what parts you need to buy to make this kit. And then there's how do you program it to make it do what it does. So there's actually like six different layers of technologies to open source. And what's really frustrating is they all have different um, uh, licensing requirements. Because source code, because it's text, it's copyrightable, so you have you know, the GPL or MIT or BSD or Mozilla licenses. The problem with hardware is every layer has different licensing requirements. Some are copyrightable, some are patentable, some are you can trademark them, some you can't. And so it's, it's actually um, part of the problem, I think, is it's, it's a little more complicated to figure out what kind of protections you have for each uh, level of open source hardware. And it sounds really boring, but fortunately this is kind of a problem. But. Yeah, so um, let's just pick one um, project here. So the Minty Boost kit, there's a circuit board here. What type of license did you uh, put on that if people wanted to make their own USB charger like this? So unfortunately, it's all de it all sort of depends on what the courts decide. And nobody, I think, has gone to court about what protections you can, like people have gone to court over book protections, so we know what it is. The circuit board, nobody's really tried out what does it mean. People are pretty sure that it's not, it's, it, the image itself is copyrightable, so you can copyright parts of it, but that the um, design itself is patented. So you kind of need a mix of both uh, licenses. So if someone wanted to make um, your Minty Boost kit, do they need to talk to you at all, or, or can they just download everything they no, no, need? It's definitely all open source, and I definitely said, you know, do whatever you want. Whatever. I, I sort of, a lot of people sort of use blanket licenses like Creative Commons, because even though Creative Commons doesn't specifically deal with hardware, it's very generic, and it's, so you can just say, like, well, we don't know what share alike means, but, you know, figure it out. And we don't quite know what... Um, attribution means, but I decided attribution means that the circuit board has to have my logo on it. So it, it, it's sort of, it, people are kind of making this up as they go along. And literally, only four months ago was like the first hardware license uh, actually written. So um, in, in this specific example, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what this does and why, why it's a dream. How many people here have iPods? So pretty fair amount, or iPod equivalents. And so you may have, needed to buy a charger after the battery started not performing as well over time and had something portable. Well, this one is uh, 20 bucks, right? Yeah, it's available in the Make Store. Available at the Make Store. And um, it performs better than the $40 ones that are that, that are touted as the best ones for this from Apple and the Apple Store. Yeah, well, we should, well, we're friends with the people who designed this. We should, right. should badmouth it, but this is a better design. And, uh, and the nice thing is you can build it yourself and learn about how it works and so what's interesting is like Apple is in my opinion one of the most ruthless companies in changing how the technology charges it sounds 
ridiculous, but it actually, it, like the iPhone charges differently than the iPod. And they do this because they want to block out, um, they want to block the uh, accessory market. It's really strange, but this is how Apple works. But by open sourcing it, I can say like, hey, you know, I just figured out exactly how they changed their circuitry, and here's a simple hack you do. And so this is, I mean, this is uh, interesting because um, this is sort of taking the software, uh, proprietary software stuff, and bringing it to hardware. And how can you get out of these proprietary uh, requirements that uh, manufacturers are putting on their products? And that, that's happened a few times. Um, people bought this charger from you like a year ago, and they bought a new iPod or iPhone. And instead of throwing it out and having to buy a new charger, they were just able to add a couple of resistors. And they just like change something around. Yeah, so it's, it's just like open source software if you find that. It's flexible. It's like one day it works for you, and one day you're like, oh, I need something slightly different. You can go in, modify it to fit your specific situation. Likewise, there's people uh, who own companies that sell, um, sell uh, you know, iPod chargers, and when the iPhone came out, they were they were actually kind of screwed. They had to buy back all the stuff and like modify it, and they could sell it. And customers were angry. With open source, I can just email everyone and say, oh, it's really simple to fix. Just do this little thing, and like now works with your iPhone. So, um, can I hand this to you? Can you pass it around? Just make sure it, it, it comes back. We want everyone to, we're going to start circulating these around. Um, so, the next, one of your next projects that um, is a good example of, I think, open source hardware is your MP3 player that you built. Yeah, we, we do. Um, there's another session today that has uh, a, an open source MP3 player. But what was the, why did you want to have your own MP3 player that you built yourself? I mean, what was the desire? Well, I think it's, it's just fun. <laughs> um, were there things in, in other music players that you didn't like? Or? Well, one thing I wanted was, uh, at the time, MP3 players didn't have FM transmitters built in. And I really wanted it to be built in so I didn't have to get an eye trip or something. Like, it really just, you could automatically transmit FM uh, to your car stereo. Because I always forgot the car stereo adapter when I went on road trips. So I built that into my design because I thought it was useful. Cool. And I think one of the projects that is a, is a neat example of, of where open source hardware um, has almost a, a political statement around it is uh, the project that you released uh, last year, the, um, the, the Wi-Fi, cell phone, Bluetooth, pretty much anything that has a RF frequency it can, it can stop. Um, why did you build this thing? I, I don't like cell phones. I'm antisocial. Um, but so the interesting thing about this stuff is that um, although it's illegal to sell, manufacture, or own, or use these devices, it's not uh, against the law to document them. So what I can do is I can document the entire process step by step of like what parts you buy and how you solder it, and that's actually completely legit. And by doing it open source, I'm I'm pretty much guaranteeing that somebody out there will copy it. And there are definitely people who email me and they're like, your website was down for an hour and I thought the feds got you, so I like had a copy and it's, it's don't worry. And I'm like, thanks. It was just that I edited the HD access file and I screwed up. And it, um, but you know, it's nice that it's because it's open source, people are, are going to, it's going to be in archive.org, it's going to be on SourceForge. And so I have this protection of, you know, all these files are distributed well across the internet and I don't have to worry about it dying you know, or getting um, you know, taken down by um, you know, the FBI. So, um, just quickly go over um, in a high-level overview. How does this work? Is it does it put out noise? Or Basically, like there's uh, there's two oscillators, and they're high-frequency oscillators, like in your microwave or your cell phone. And there's a lot of control circuitry. And what it does is you uh, connect it to your computer via USB, and you say, "I want to jam." Uh, you know, PCS, that's like 1850 megahertz to 1900 megahertz, something like that. And uh, then it will like tune itself and it'll just broadcast uh, lots of noise on that spectrum. And phones get very confused and they just usually just give up and they're like, I'm going to try later and they see no signal. Or sometimes they crash. <laughs> and then with Wi Fi or GPS or. Yeah, Wi Fi is not so good. Like, computers do not like it when you jam their Wi Fi, they like lock up. Or like Max, the like black screen. If you ever seen the black screen, it's like really rare to get those. A kernel crash. So you should you should never take this to the Apple store and turn it on. <laughs> just, just don't do it. Like I know you're thinking like, wow, that'd be kind of fun because there's all these Macs and everyone's checking their email. But you should not do that. And when we pass this around, please do not press the yellow button. Don't press the yellow. Because button. our store here all runs it's off. It's all my
So we'll pass it around if you promise not to press the yellow button. <laughs>